Hello and welcome to Talk Thursday. I'm Maria Ressa. Joining us today to talk about the new cybercrime law is attorney Teddy Te. He is an associate professor at the UP Law School, also a lawyer with FLAG, the Free Legal Assistance Group. He's just come back from a year in the United States where he finished his master's at Columbia. And he actually, we were in the same batch um, to, uh, with the Twine Awards yes. in 2002, so that dates us. Um, <laughs> Ted, what is wrong with this law? Uh, well, Long and short, the law basically offends the Constitution, particularly the right to freedom of expression, freedom of the press, uh, uh, double jeopardy. Many, many portions of this law are actually in violation of the Constitution. That's what's wrong with this law. About libel, though, the revised penal code is basically just transposed onto the yes. Internet and there are larger penalties. One degree higher. The, 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 the cybercrime law says it will be punished one degree higher. Now. Uh, I don't want to get into a technical discussion sure. of the penalties. That they're, they're a bit hard to understand. But what happens there is essentially the law telling us that whatever the penalty for conventional, I just use that word, conventional libel is, yes. uh, all you do is transpose it and make it heavier by, by one degree. One degree would he, here would mean six, six years up to maybe eight years. In, in prison. In prison. Right. And the significant thing about that one degree is this. If a person is convicted under conventional libel, under the revised penal code, yes. theoretically that person could avail of probation, meaning he or she could actually evade jail time by, by essentially availing of the probation law. Right. Anything under six years, you can actually avail of probation. Because of that one degree, you can. Okay. You, will be, you will be going to jail because of that. Right. And if, you're, uh, if, you, if you make a living online, yes. if you write online, if you blog, you know, if you're an online journalist, then that poses a real danger to you, uh, different from what the, the revised penal code already provides. So it's one step. Yeah. It, it, it is a step yeah. up. It has an immediate impact yes, on a group it, like Rapper, it does. for example. It does, yes. um, In terms, J.J. Decini says that it also gives you, gives tremendous powers to um, the Secretary of Justice. Yes, it uh, does. A takedown right. part of the law. Can you 19. explain that? Yeah, Section 19. Essentially, the, the Secretary of Justice is given the power to, to, to shut you down, right? Even without, even without a court order, the Secretary of Justice effectively is the one that oversees everything here. Yes. And under the Constitution, if you were to come up with an analogy, the closest analogy to this would be a search or seizure. And under the Constitution, only a judge can order a search or seizure. Now, there are provisions here in the law for warrants. Mm -hmm. But again, the, the, because of the power given under Section 19 to restrict or block access to computer data, yes. and the power is given to the DOJ, then that actually puts the, the, the DOJ on the same level as a court, which, which you can't do under the Constitution. Uh, I'll just be devil's mm. advocate for a second. Mm -hmm. it, um, some some proponents will say that's important because in today's day and age, you have viral spread of right. things. Um, how would you respond to that? Yeah, what what they can do, what they could have done, is really to put in some safeguards, put in clear standards. Correct. Section nineteen simply says prima facie. Yes. Okay. When the when a computer data is prima facie found to be in violation of the provisions of the act, the DOJ shall issue an order taking it down. Now, the difficulty I have with Prima Fasci is it has a very low standard. Correct. Uh, to put it very directly, uh, Prima Fasci is simply from the perspective of, of an ordinary person. Right. The, the court has defined it in that way. If, a, if an ordinary person perceives an act and he or she perceives it to be in violation of the law, then that is sufficient to satisfy Prima Fasci. To put it another way, prima facie is simply on the face. If it appears to you on the face without anything else to be in violation, then you can actually already take it down. It's just a, it could be whimsical. It could be whimsical. And yes. that is the problem with that. Yes. So I would have preferred it, for example, if the law had spelled out under what conditions Correct. can the DOJ secretary issue this order. Now, I'm coming from the perspective that there are certain specific rights that the Constitution guarantees. guarantees. Because of these rights, then the, 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 any exception to these rights must be strictly and narrowly read. But the law reverses that. The law actually uh, provides for these take-down provisions as the general rule rather than the exception. Um, this is an interesting question that came in on social mm -hmm. media. If you're watching us, please tweet your questions. Use hashtag Talk Thursday. Uh, this is from at Rafi Magno. Mm -hmm. How could the cybercrime law affect the dynamics of the social media world? Oh. 
I think it will it will really affect the dynamics of of, of people on social media simply because now you have to think very very seriously before you post anything that's one because they're cyber libel two there is the there is the threat of being monitored the real time real time surveillance effectively right so and you don't know when that's going to happen so uh it, you talk about the chill you talk about yes. the chilling effect that's the chilling effect so in terms of how people express themselves on social media, which is one of the freest yes. forms of media, then you have now people thinking about restrictions, thinking about, will this happen to me? Am I going to be charged? And that's where the chill comes in. That's where the danger comes in. Does this violate principles of privacy? I mean, this is in the United States, for example, mm -hmm. that's a huge deal. I mean, the kind of monitoring that right. the law allows, does it violate it, principles? It actually does. It, in my opinion, it does, it does violate the, the, the right to privacy here. Our problem, though, in, in the Constitution, the Constitution does not expressly guarantee a right to privacy. The Constitution speaks of privacy in relation to communications and correspondence. So, in a very broad sense, yes. it would cover this. So, but then, because the, 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 the medium is different, when the Constitution was written, you know, social media was not yet, you know, was not yet in effect. You know, right. No one had Twitter, Facebook, they were not yet there. Or could even imagine it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, in terms, of, in terms of this law coming in now and saying, look, you, can, you cannot do that, you can't do that, the question now would be, how would this particular right uh, guaranteed by the Constitution, right to be, to to ha have certain communications kept private. How would this particular right impact on the on the provisions of this law? Which one would prevail? So I think that would be the question. That would be one of the questions that should be presented to the court. Right. Well, there have been cases now that are fi yes. filed at the Supreme Court. Right. What's being done, and what can you see? Be to what should be done next? Well, I, I think that, uh, the court should look seriously at the petitions being presented and I hope that the court will come up with a, a clear substantive ruling mm -hmm. and not simply rely on a technicality when, by, a, by a technicality I would I would uh, mean the, the standing requirement because the, the dynamics of the court is that you know, if the court wants a case yes. wants to decide a case they will look for an exception to decide the case there is what we call a transcendental importance exception. Mm -hmm. it, uh, the, the court has used that in instances where there is no standing, but they want to decide the issue. Yes. They say the issue is of such transcendental importance that even if, it, if there's no direct injury, we'll take on the case. Yes. But it has also denied that exception in certain instances when it does not want to handle the case. Mm -hmm. So they will say, you have no standing, we'll throw it out. And this is the first test and this for is this the, new... Yes, this is the first major controversy that would face the, the the new Chief Justice, Chief Justice. Under, under, with this court. Yeah. Um, from her record, how do you think she'll, she'll tackle this? Mm, well, her, her training is in the academe. Okay. Okay? She's used to a lot of technical writing, uh, scholarly writing, but she also has training in terms of, uh, she also has, she's young enough to have been exposed to, 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 to social media, to the use of the uh, electronic communication. So, so we're, we're talking about a, a a, a chief justice who's young enough to exp have experienced the conventional way of expressing yourself and the, the newer ways of expressing yourself. So I'm hoping that you know, that perspective uh, spreads and that she's able to influence the court to say that, hey, this is a very important issue. Yes. Uh, people, young, younger people, and even some of the older people are, are now looking at things differently particularly the younger people, they're wired differently, yes. they speak differently, they understand things differently, and therefore this particular law is a very, very important law in terms of how it regulates how people think. And I'm hoping that the court will come up with a very clear pronouncement on that. Well, let me just clarify, this was something, that, again, that's been brought up and discussed a lot. If, you, if there's something libelous mm -hmm. that's sent to you, you retweet it, and it's retweeted mm -hmm. and retweeted, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. where does liability lie? And, and, and that's, that's the problem with this law. Because what the law simply does, this law, is simply incorporate existing provisions of libel in the revised penal code and just say, okay, the same offense will be punished if you use a computer to do the same thing. Now, the usual problem with conventional libel is, of course, authorship. But in conventional libel, authorship is not difficult to, to trace because right. the person who has a byline, the person who writes it, 
will identify himself or herself. So that's not a problem. Correct. And in terms of republication, yes. unless there was malicious intent, yes. if it's republication, it shouldn't be a problem. But here, because you know, because of the nature of social media, yes. because of the nature of the internet, so the the unsettled question is what happens to a person who really does republish? Correct. On on retweet, re uh, quote the tweet on social media, share, yes. you know, like even. Yes. For example, are you joining the are you joining the the opinion by simply liking it on Facebook? So those are questions that don't have answers in this law. And that would I think lead to 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 guessing on the part of officials. When officials have to guess, then you have a problem. Correct. Because there are very strict penal provisions here. So if you were to look at if you were to look at uh, decisions of the Supreme Court on search and seizure there, there have been decisions where the court has said that if a police officer has to guess, mm -hmm. then that indicates lack of probable cause, lack yes. of, lack of uh, basis to conclude that Correct. the search should have been conducted. Does that standard apply here? And that's one question the court must answer yes. because the law does not provide for it. It can't be provided in the IRR simply because, you know, if the, the, the IRR say, says, for example, that, hey, this is the standard, but that's not what the law says. Correct. So the IRR you know, can't go beyond. Can't go beyond what the, the law, law provides. Right. So that is a problem. Right. So that's one of the substantive issues I think the court must address. Well, it's interesting because in the law itself, there are basic definitions that society is still trying to figure out. Yes. Like who is a publisher if you have a social media account right. or you automatically right. a publisher, right? Right. So it's, it's interesting. Um, I have more questions mm -hmm. coming to you from social media. So let me throw this one mm -hmm. is Rapplers coming in from Achai Hofilenya. Mm -hmm. How do you balance constitutional rights with the need to run after cyber criminals who engage in identity theft, cyber sex? Mm -hmm. How do you balance rights with responsibilities? The way I would uh, the way I would have preferred would have been to to separate a law that regulates uh, online uh, publications, online utterances and c come up maybe with a set of regulations, even a Magna Carta for, for netizens, a Magna yes. Carta for online publications. And if you wanted to punish uh, cyber sex yes. uh, offenders, then you can actually just amend the revised penal code. So you separate the two the and add it to the revised law. penal yeah. code. Instead of having one law yes, cover exactly. everything in an alternate right. universe. Right. You know, it was like so in, in terms of this particular law, what people notice are the p penal provisions. And so, you know, you don't notice the, 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 the policy content behind the law simply because the penal provisions take over. Yes. And because people, the fear comes in and say, and people start thinking, am I going to be punished for this if I go on the internet? So one way of balancing it would have been to say, yes, there is a legitimate interest in protecting people against yes. cyber sex offenders. Yes. And how do you do that? There are existing penal laws. You can actually amend the penal code and you know, just insert a provision in the penal code Correct. and provide for penalties there. About and then you can object. actually now balance how you, how you regulate uh, online expression, online uh, transactions, online journalism, come up with a law that basically just defines that yes. without penal provisions. That's so that, that is one yes, way of balancing yes, yes. it. It's Se like, it's like they, the they jump too far, yes, they overreach. And, and put everything in one law. This law seems flawed just at the very... Uh, I, th I the think, basic. yeah, I, even, the, even the approach, I, I would disagree with the approach simply because, you know, they put everything in one law right. and did not bother to separate the, 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 two, the, the, the two policies. Yeah. Could you give us the history? I mean, how did this law mm. get through? How did it start? How did it, it get signed into? You know, I, st I, started, I started trying to figure out the history. And of course, I, I, I'm not privy to how it got to Malacanang and how it ultimately you know, got to the attention of the president, whether the president you know, uh, asked questions about the law and said, OK, isn't this dangerous? The reality is he signed it, so it became law. But one interesting thing that I saw when I was doing uh, some research on this was one of the House bills that, yes. that, that uh, became the basis of this law was actually attributable to former President Gloria Arroyo. How fascinating. In Congress. Yes. And she was one of the sponsors of this law, I think, if, I'm, if, if my research is correct. Uh, Congressman Dato Arroyo was also part of the, part of the or original proponents of this law. So, so the Arroyos were the, were the first proponents and <laughs> well, well, signed the law by the, a At Latino. least one of the first, yeah, one of the first. And that, yes. that's, that's interesting, that's ironical, yeah. Um, this is a, a question coming in from at Mick University. Are mm. they serious believing they can moderate the internet? How mm. can they, does DOJ know much about it? Yeah, and, and that's, that, that's a very dangerous proposition to say that you will moderate the internet. Uh, we've, had ex we've seen experiences with 
states trying to regulate or moderate the internet. And yes. this usually happens in in authoritarian regimes, you know, China. Correct. Arab Myanmar, Spring in Egypt, yes. Myanmar, for example. And it's an all or nothing thing. Yes. Uh, in, in Egypt, what they did was they shut it down. So that's a problem, and right? In each of the instances, they failed in some way. In exactly. Egypt, they, they started it again. Yeah. Anyway, can, so so that, that's, that's who, is that where we're headed? And uh, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a dangerous proposition. So one thing, though, that I noticed, and it's supposed to be the policy arm of government. Yes. It does say that you know, there should be a Department of Information and Communications Technology. To my knowledge, that, that department hasn't been exist. created yet. Yes. So it's strange that you have a law that has been passed that gives great powers to, to agencies of the state to, to regulate the internet, yet the department that's supposed to provide the policy direction hasn't been created yet. To my knowledge, it, it's only been second reading in the Senate. Yes. So I don't know how, how far that's going to go. And it seems schizophrenic because people are still divided on whether or not you can take the re the revised penal code, yes. the existing laws, and translate it exactly. to the internet, right? Yes. And yet now you have this law that yeah. comes in and tries to regulate the entire internet. Um, and, the, and the entire revised penal code. <laughs> if you look at section one of the sections in the cybercrime law, all offenses all criminal offenses in the revised penal code and in special laws every penal offense existing right now is transposed to this law everything let me just find let really? me just look for it yeah it's in section six all crimes defined and penalized by the revised penal code and special laws if committed by through and with the use of information and communications technologies shall be covered by this act and one degree higher everything so all it, crimes, murder, <sighs> homicide, estafa, rape. Try to imagine whatever crime, it's covered. That's incredible. Um, what kind of vetting did this law get? <laughs> Were you consulted? Well, I, I, I didn't hear of any consultations on this. I, yes. I, maybe the, some of the lawyers who were working on, on, on cyber, cyber law would probably have been consulted. But yes. for something as drastic as this, I would have expected maybe more consultations, more wide-ranging discussions, even debates on yes. this. And uh, my, my impression, the way, I, the, way I, the way I look at it, was this law basically just snuck past everyone you know, and ended up as on the president's desk and he signed it. Well, some of the congressmen who, who worked on this said that they the last part, the cyber, the cyber libel, libel. Yeah. was actually an insertion. Yeah, it was a rider. Words, yeah. A rider that came yeah. on, so they felt like the bicam actually acted as a separate, and, as a separate and body. That, and that's always a problem with the bicam. I mean, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a recognized device in, in Senate and House deliberations, but it, it does amount to a third House of Congress, if you think about it, because the bicam is all powerful, Correct. and it's it's hard to it's hard to to pierce what they talk about in the bicam. It's very untransparent. A lot of negotiations go on there, and as in this case, uh, a rider was placed in apparently during the bicam, not not during the debate. So not none of the discussions right. would reflect why a cyber crime uh, cyber libel was even. Uh, inserted, you no. Know, uh, if you were to challenge the the reason for the law, then you would have to ask people who were there at the bike camp. Yes. You wouldn't see it in the journal. You wouldn't see it in the record. And that is the value of a plenary discussion. That's yes. the value of wide ranging consultations because you can make known your positions. So yeah, I and mean, it, it's dangerous. Section section six, section seven, section four. Those are the those are the those are the the provisions that penalize and. I cannot imagine a provision of law that says every penal offense existing now and those that come later will be covered by this law. So look, That's jumping everything. off of that, yeah. uh, at Gemma B. Mendoza, who is also a rappler, um, says, Constitution says every bill passed by Congress should embrace only one subject. Yeah. Doesn't the cybercrime law violate this requirement? Well, that, 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 that general rule can actually be circumvented and has actually been circumvented by the phrase, the all-important phrase, and for other purposes. So that's what they do. They, the, re the reason why that phrase is there is to justify any writers. And uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, this particular title has that. So if we were to challenge it, and yes. but although I agree, you know, the, 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 the title itself does not you know, confine its provisions. The, some of the provisions are really, are really beyond what the title provides. But mo more importantly, the title does say 
an act defining cybercrime, providing for prevention, investigation, suppression. So there, there it is. You know, there, there is really an intent, as reflected by the title, to really get ahead of it. And if you were to talk about cyber libel, if you were to talk about uh, utterances that would have been uh, protected by the Constitution if not for this law, okay. then you have a law that actually says part of the policy of the law is to suppress that. And it's reflected in the title of the law. So if we were to look at the law in its entirety, yes. uh, and if the court were to agree that it does violate the Constitution, I think the entire law would have to be struck down, despite its sever severability provisions, because the title does say it, yes. suppression. And whenever you talk about suppression, and you have a content-related offense like libel, yes. for example, then nothing, would, nothing should survive. And that's unfortunate, because there are legitimate interests right. to be protected, you know, cyber, se cyber sex offenders yes. and all of those things. You know? There are legitimate interests to be protected. But I think the balance there should have been struck. Um, again, just to go, mm -hmm. if, if you take the revised penal code and then just transpose it onto the internet, which is what this does, does mm -hmm. every penalty, does every transgression then have, have doubled the number yes. of? Yes, one degree every. higher, every. So te just on that alone yeah. is. So, so let's, talk about, let's talk about homicide, for yes. example. Someone plans to kill another person. Yes, and the talks person, about the it person on social emails, media. And the person emails someone and says, I'll pay you this much, yes. kill this person for me. The other person says, sure response right and he manages to kill the person now if that person is person a is charged as the mastermind of this of this particular offense he could be charged under this this law he used an ict device yes and whatever penalty he would get under conventional murder would be doubled one degree higher incredible so that's that's where the danger comes in every crime imaginable um what are the parts of this law that you think are good well, definitely the well the, the the policy is there. The policy is important, okay. okay? And the and some of the some of the acts that are punished are are legitimate. Yes. They're they're reasonable. They're actually urgent, for example. But uh, again, cy cy cyber sex, child pornography. I mean, it's hard to argue against those, right? So, but the thing is, uh, because of the way that the law was written, because of because of this rider because of the, the broad-ranging powers given to the DOJ, because of the, the weak standards, the, the weak safeguards, then you know, the, whole, the whole law is now suspect. And the legitimate interest of the state in, 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 in punishing those reprehensible offenses, you know, now it's, it's now suspect as well. From at Mark Bonney, there are efforts to get signatures to repeal the cybercrime mm -hmm. law. I know mm -hmm. almost 100 who will sign. What? What's available now for people? What can be done against mm, this? Okay. Uh, well, two ways, of course. One is to somehow get Congress, two houses of Congress, to repeal the law in the time remaining. Which okay. is like roughly a week, left, <laughs> a right? Week. Before yeah. it, it takes effect. Yeah, okay. before it takes effect. And well, they did get the corona, the corona legislation. Well, yes, that's days. true. Okay. But that had Continue. the support of the president. Correct. Okay. <laughs> so, but the other way would be technically a, a recall under the, the provisions on initiative and referendum. Okay. But that's very, very difficult because you have, you, have, you have specific numbers that are required per district, you know, per province, et cetera, et cetera. It's not, a, it's not easy, but the, the remedy is available. People can actually just sign petitions as long as it reaches the appropriate number, then it may, re it may result in a recall of the law. That, that is an untested mechanism. It hasn't been done yet. Wow. So it can actually be done. But uh, I don't know if the numbers are sufficient, but it, it's actually open. Of course, if, you know, if Senator Gingona, as he has said, he w pushes through with his, with, his, with his promise to repeal particular portions of the law, yes. if he convinces people in the Senate and in the House to, to repeal the, the law, then, then it, would, you know, it would solve the problem. In fact, he just had a discussion this morning mm -hmm. in Padre Faura, and there is a live blog that you can go to. We'll tweet you the link to that um, if, you're, if you're interested in pushing through with it, because I think he is, yeah, for sure. I think that would be good. That would yeah. be good. Um, ordinary citizens now, aside from doing this, I mean, what else can be done? What else can they do? Can they do anything else? Uh, well, People on the web, 
people on social media watching us now people people on the web primarily i think the one important thing here is to to understand to understand what the law actually does uh in terms of your rights to try to understand your rights within what this law provides and exercise those rights uh as in as as much as you can now part of it is to to understand that uh the law does allow you to do certain things and the law does not allow you to do certain things now uh there are there are petitions that have been filed i think one important way of you know taking a position here is to read one read the provisions of the petitions if you agree with them then you know join the petitions because i think more than any other uh law uh this particular law governs an 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 untested area correct the rights of people on the web and the the more i think the more important the 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 broader principle here is the the conflict between between technologies new technologies and existing rights we cannot forever be you know be demonizing technology and this is what the law effectively uses I, i i think I, I, I agree with the phrase that Senator Gingona used in his, in his speech or in his piece. He said, we're demonizing technology. Correct. You know, te- technology is neutral. It should be neutral. It can be used for you know, good and bad. Correct. So, in, but if this law, this law sounds posit- positively paranoid about technology by incorporating everything, yes. you know, that has been ever punished by conventional means and punishing it with one degree higher penalties simply because of technology you're saying that you know you're you're discouraging people from from using a technology that could actually help correct uh, it promotes you know quicker responses it makes people aware more quickly than conventional means you know it so uh, that that's the broader policy perspective and yes. i think it's unfortunate that you have a law like this that may make people reconsider you know the technology makes yes. people reconsider uh, being more active online yes. because unfortunately that's how people think now how kids think how younger people think yes. and how you can relate to those younger people yes. so we can't forever stay you know in in a time in a time bubble where you know we pretend that this technology doesn't exist that the internet doesn't exist that people are not on online it's changing the world and exactly. changing businesses yes you know so yeah what does this show about our lawmakers right now i mean you have one dissenting opinion senator mm-hmm. gingona I mean, yeah. and the and the rest it was it was passed pretty yeah. much unanimously except for the dissenting opinion um what does it show it it it, it well it's actually uh it's actually a reflection of not only of congress but you know a lot of institutions of government we are we are we're way behind in terms of how we perceive the use of technology. The courts are not immune from that. You know, the Supreme Court, until a few years back, was not into DNA technology, was not into forensic science. You know, the, we, the court was still talking about you know, eyewitness identification prevailing over scientific evidence. Correct. You know, and, yes. And you know, DNA has been in effect for so long in, in the U.S., in the Europe. So, that's a problem uh, in terms of information, access to information, using the using the net, using technology, using using text messaging. You know, we're still on paper. We're no we're not yet using uh, all of these technologies. Yes. Right. So, it it does it does show, unfortunately, very graphically that there is a there is a wide gap Digital between how yes. how the Congress, how courts, how even some parts of the executive uh, exist. And how, a, maybe a greater number of the a greater majority of the people actually live, because more people are on the web, more people use smartphones, more people rely on the on technology rather than on paper. So yeah, uh, a Singapore group d- just said that the Philippines leads the region in terms of smartphone growth. Right. It grew three hundred twenty six percent this year alone. Exactly. Okay, your your last words, Ted. Um, I mean, in terms of what what we do next, where does this go? Well, I, I I I'm really I'm really monitoring very 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 uh, curiously what what will happen with with the cases, and what will happen with this law. Uh, I, and again, I'm hoping really that the Supreme Court basically takes on the challenge, uh, comes up with a very clear ruling, uh, 
and hopefully that it, it's, it's able to separate the, the important policy objectives of the law Correct. from the offending provisions of the law, particularly on, on, on constitutional rights, and manages to strike that balance. Because it's, it's a very important law uh, in many ways, but it's also, it's also a very important test for the Supreme Court with, with the new Chief Justice, with, the, with, the, with, with this particular dynamic going on. So I, I'm, I'm monitoring very, very, very earnestly this, this petition and these laws. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much for Thank your you, insights. Maria. We've been speaking with Attorney Teddy Te on the new cybercrime law. Uh, we can continue this conversation. He is on Twitter. His Twitter handle is at Ted Te. Um, there are many more questions that we didn't have time for, but please post them on, on Rappler.com's Facebook page. Ted Te is also on Facebook. He's, ve he's very plugged into social media, guys. <laughs> so let's continue this. This is something that affects all of us. I'm Maria Ressa. This is Talk Thursday. We'll continue soon. Bye-bye.